So our question today for you is what is the future of the digital turn in the new literacy studies? Now, this is the sound of a robotic voice of GLaDOS from a popular video game called Portal. Perhaps you've heard of it. It was a game my son used to play, and you'll understand why I'm sharing this in a moment. Hello, and again, welcome to the Aperture Science Computer Aided Enrichment Center. We hope your brief detention in the relaxation vault has been a pleasant one. Your specimen has been processed, and we are now ready to begin the test proper. Before we start, however, keep in mind that although fun and learning are the primary goals of all enrichment center activities, serious in And this is a video of my youngest child when she was only five. She said she was doing the voice of GLaDOS while she was sight reading a book called Scratch Kitten Goes to Sea. You'll need to turn up your volume to hear this well. A long time for Scratch to come his nervous, but a few hours later he crawled out of his hiding place and sniffed the salty air. No slinking dogs, no nagging brothers and sisters, just the splashing of the waves and the flapping of the sails, the shouting of the sailors and the cries of the seagulls high above the mast. So there are two things I'd like to draw your attention to here. The first is that literacy and the digital world are no longer two separate entities. Even this reading of a printed book is a hybrid reading. It overlays voice impersonation and it's an intertextual reference to GLaDOS from the digital game, which the child has observed being played by her brother. The second thing, isn't that a remarkable five-year-old? The digital turn in the new literacy studies was the title of my article in Review of Educational Research in 2010, and it was based on G's concept of the social turn, so it was a bit of a pun. Literacy practices are indeed social practices, but they're increasingly mediated by digital technologies. And this is a consequence of the technological change and circulation of text globally, which is sped up supported by the internet, social media, and mobile devices. Much of the new literacy studies research of practices across communities was already notably describing this shift in digital practices by the turn of the century. And certainly by 2010, it was starting to comprise as much or maybe even more of what we would call uh, conventional literacy practices. These, this process of the digitalization of literacy practices and broader contexts of learning have been given even greater priority, as you know, since the COVID pandemic. So what is the new literacy studies? Well, literacy research is based on a socio-cultural theory. Literacy practices vary by their cultural communities. So if you're not familiar with this literature, theorists such as Street, G, Heath, Barton and others are key figures. There were also the ethnographies of communication, which showed that vernacular speech communities are actually very important because language practices carry meanings primarily through their entrenchment in specific cultural values and orientations. So there's not one universal literacy um, but rather many. For example, many Indigenous communities here in Australia use cultural songs, dances, artwork, and these are all part of their language culture. And this begins with a child's early socialization in these cultures. So language is seen as functioning as a tool for interacting with one's social environment. Literacy practices are then seen primarily as constructions of particular social groups and rather, rather than just attributed to individual cognition. And that of course is important, but not cognition alone. And so this is a very different view of literacy than we've seen 
um, emphasised in, say, standardised testing programs of literacy or by politicians. So at the turn of the century, scholars of the new literacy studies began to draw attention to many different kinds of literacy practices that were increasingly involving hybrid digital uses of technology. The question then arises, well, what are the boundaries of literacy then? If there's so many new modern technologies uh, and there's this, you know, blurring of boundaries between traditional literacies and different modes and different media, where do new literacies stop? As one commentator has humorously asked, why not count, say, arable farming as a literacy practice? You know, it does mark the landscape and it uses technological advances. New literacy studies defines literacy as socially organized practices that make use of a symbol system and a technology for producing and disseminating it. And when I say technology, this could be the technology of a pen or a pencil or a quill. And now we have more digital uh, technologies. Examples of the kinds of new literacy studies um, focus with things like blogs, infographics on the internet, digital comics, videos, social media posts, computer coding, animations, extended reality texts, um, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, even electronic sculptures. So textual practices are constantly changing and they require these new technical proficiencies. Most of the examples of the new literacy studies um, in 2010 often contained references to spoken or written words as the principal mode, and then there were other modes. So even though it was opening up the boundaries of literacy in schools, we still, and, and in the research, there was this emphasis, kind of like words are on a higher level they're hierarchically better. And then you can have images. Yes, it's okay to have images and audio as long as you've got words. But despite the debates about where words should fit in a literacy practice, uh, it was agreed that conventional forms of reading and writing were no longer adequate to describe the varieties of practices that we engage with every day using digital technology. So one of the debates in the new literacy studies, and this is um, why I mentioned your group having in and out of school literacies or um, informal and, and formal contexts. And this was really important in the new literacy studies because um, what they did was focus a lot on the informal practices of youth and adolescents out of school and sort of went into homes and, and did little ethnographies to say, hey, what are these youth doing online? This is amazing. They're playing video games, then they're chatting, then they're doing blogs, and then they're doing going to a wiki, and then they've got a fan site, and then they've got Japanese anime, and they've got all these things. Researchers would go out and look at these practices and say, well, wow, look at all these great things that young people are doing. And, and they highlighted this wide range of peer and interest-driven practices of the youth, usually in online spaces, and they were prominent in the early literacy um, studies of the 2000s. Then researchers started to caution, well, we also need to be careful not to romanticize these out-of-school literacy practices because there are many formal literacy practices with digital technologies that young people are still um, not traversing in these spaces. Also, we shouldn't homogenize all the experiences of youth and adolescents because many of them actually lack some basic access to a computer in the home. For example, I was at a holiday program in Toledo, Ohio in the USA for my research and children came to the program for a week on digital on scholarships to do digital practices. So there were equity scholarships for kids who were from underprivileged backgrounds. So we taught these kids how to make digital sculptures and kinetic e-paintings. This is things like using Arduino kits with batteries, bulbs, wires, breadboards, programming them, programming the lights in their traditional paintings and sculptures. Absolutely brilliant and cutting edge. 
But at the end of the program, um, all of the kids were given an Arduino kit to take home. And so I saw one of the mums and I said, oh, this is great. The kids can take these Arduino kits home. Your kids were doing a great job with their programming and they can continue to develop these skills. And she said, oh, can, you, can they use it with the mobile phone? And I said, oh, no, no, you have to have a computer or a laptop. And she said, oh, we don't have a computer. Well, we've got Wi-Fi on the mobile phone. And it just made me realise that a lot of these interventions that we do, they're not targeting the skills that kids need in some of these settings where they don't even have access to one computer in the home. And this wasn't very long ago. This was in um, 2019. So this is something that we thought years ago would have been fixed by now, but it's not. So by the 2010s, there was a growing number of new literacy studies that were demonstrating the teaching of digitalized practices of literacy in schools. So there was a little bit of attention then saying, well, if these kids aren't getting access to this in their informal context, we actually need to be teaching them at school because some of these children will not actually get access to these skills and they're becoming more and more important, not less important. Um, and so um, others then criticised the in-school, out-of-school, informal and uh, formal context of literacy distinction because they said that what's going on out in, in these um, online spaces is actually intergenerational struggles. So there's struggles about what are the literacy norms across sites, um, what is recognised as a valued literacy practice amongst older people and younger generations. And so it's quite complex, these overlapping um, distinctions. So the question arises then, have author has authoritative literacy and knowledge been destabilized? Has the rise of these literacy practices and knowledge practices in the online spaces actually um, changed what counts as literacy um, to, to educators as well, but in all these different sites. And what we see is that many of the new literacy practices are learnt by youth engaging with more experienced online co-conspirators. So they're actually not seeking out traditional authority figures like teachers to be able to do these online skills. They're learning them from their more experts, peers, peer collaboration, online mentors, and this is all based on voluntary interests and support. Young people have significant ownership of their online self-presentation, their learning and their evaluation of others. And there are different markers of identity and status in these online communities of practice. Um, my daughter told me one the other day that if you go up to a friend and you say, um, tell me what social media you're on. If you say that you're from MySpace or you have a MySpace, they will look at you as if you're an alien from another country and you lose status very quickly. But if you're on Snap, Snapchat, and you have an Insta account, you're immediately much higher and more trending. And so there are these different markers of uh, social status in these online spaces there are also new forms of online etiquette and behaviour for acceptance by these particular groups. So do any of these new literacies have some academic value, we might ask? And this is really important for all of those um, in didactics and in educational settings. So some of the new literacy studies research has attempted to see if these new literacy studies um, interventions like Quest Atlantis um, yields measurable learning outcomes at school. And they've actually shown some very successful learning gains over time across a variety of skill areas where there are some transfer or overlap. Many new literacy studies demonstrated successful ways for integrating multimodal and digital practices in schools and after school programs that are aligned with the official curriculum. And I've done many of these kinds of projects myself. So for example, if a teacher is uh, doing poetry, she might do spoken word poetry or hip hop. People are using Minecraft education and video games in schools, using virtual worlds to teach concepts. 
and doing online chats. They've shown also the challenges that teachers encounter when trying to integrate some of these digital practices in schools. In Australia, the teaching of multimodal literacy, that is reading and writing that uses many modes or you know, words, images, audio, is actually a requirement of the national curriculum here. And it's a requirement from when kids start school at age four and a half, right through to year 12. And this is partly because academics have been inputting into the curriculum uh, reformulations to get these um, skills put into the curriculum. And so this has been a good thing because there's less disconnect between what kids are doing in the online spaces and what they're learning at school. So many studies have shown that there are positive learning gains, increased student motivation, and strong engagement in learning when these out of school literacies are extended into school spaces and also many in after school programs as well. So another key question then is if literacy is a, a practice that varies across um, communities, um, what about practices that are common across sites? So this is actually called the limits of the local because if, um, if you look at any local site, it's going to be connected in some way to a global environment. Each community or online space is not operating on its own, but within a broader global sphere of interconnected sites. So um, I thought it would be interesting to have a look at some of the practices that are common across sites. And when you look at all of these separate little studies of these ethnographies and practices with youth, what's actually emerging as some of the common trends that are becoming more and more important in the digital age. So by 2010, we started to see some multi-site studies of literacy practices. And we'll have a look at what some of these um, common features were. One of the key features was the hybridization of textual practices. That is the blending or modification of literacy practices that results in new practices. A good example is relay writing. I don't know if you've heard of it, but you can have lots of students on a blog and each one contributes one part of the story. So the first person writes a short post of 140 characters, the next person continues it. Now this type of a group story wasn't very common in offline spaces and it's very suited to the sort of community-centered uh, microblogging activity. Another example is how for years we've used personal diaries in a kind of booklet form, but now online we have um, weblogs or blogs. So basically people are logging their travel and all the things they do and sharing it with millions of users. And of course, there's a lot of images as well. And there's a particular genre which has to be learned to be able to do that well. There's new hybridizations of grammar, new types of spelling. And as you know, in things like text messaging, it gets very informal. And so we also have a lot of colloquial language popping up and abbreviated language in text messages. So the other key thing is that we, that we see a lot more creative production of digital media. So with the rise of web two, um, which was when we um, moved away from the read only uses of the internet, it became easier to actually produce things on the internet rather than simply reading forums. For those of you who are old enough to remember back in 1999 when you might have gone into a online forum and those days are, are, are not the same anymore people started to produce their own websites that was simple um, go on to wordpress and then we had uh, social media and so everybody was a producer we saw um, large new literacy studies interventions like the computer clubhouse by resnick and rusk and that has served youth from underprivileged communities in creative digital production it's still in operation today, 100 clubhouses in 21 countries. Um, by the 2010s, um, we also saw increasing examples of teachers and students using more sophisticated tools for digital production, 
video cr creation, robotics, music remixing, coding and animation creation. And these often involved intertextuality, creativity, and were very um, often um, co-constructed and co-constructed knowledge. The other feature that was key is the area of um, collaborative online communities. And you may have heard of this from G, he calls these affinity groups. So we have groups of people with shared interests. These communities have value the distributed expertise amongst the members, and there's greater visibility and connectivity between the text and the text users. There were new collaborative writing tools, for example, like wikis and Google Docs. And then um, this was contrasted with fewer expert dominated textual practices where we might go to say a book to find out things, whereas now we would go to Google. We saw texts were gaining much wider audiences online. And at the same time, educators were tackling new complexities associated with things like collaborative writing assessments. How do we actually assess that when we've had a whole group of young people all working on the same text? One of the criticisms of the new literacy studies has been that the new literacy studies may be tracing exotic literacies of the white uh, middle class. So um, if we take all these ethnographies and say, look at these youths doing all these amazing things, are we actually just looking at the literacies that are accessible to a few? So I thought this was a really important question to have a look at. So when I reviewed the new literacy studies that were available then in 2010, what I found in fact was the opposite. So there were actually more examples of new literacy studies conducted with culturally diverse students and economically marginalized groups than with the privileged. And the social justice agenda was actually really strong in the new literacy studies tradition. New literacy studies included research from Spain, Uganda, Brazil, South Africa, Greece, Rwanda, rural China, rural Vietnam and Cambodia, to name just a few locations. And this research has highlighted some of the challenges that literacy educators and teachers have in places like Uganda. There, the out-of-school literacies are often not rich. They're often not frequent and they're not necessarily digitally mediated. So simply giving physical access to technology and doing short-term interventions is not enough. And it doesn't necessarily translate to literacy success for many of these marginalized groups. A key question that I've come to since doing the 2010 literacy studies review is this question that I have now. And I've been watching and researching how we're using digital media and what new things have evolved in digital spaces. My question now is, are youth making new media or is new media making them? In digital media environments in recent years, algorithms and automation are now involved in a host of processes inside the black box. Algorithms are used to target up advertisements based on predictive analytics. It filters information and generates relevant content. Websites track users' digital footprints, while providers are data mining and profiling users who are often very young children. Attentional and behavioral engineering is used to bring back users to websites and apps, to get them to engage for that bit longer, to click again, to make another purchase. While research has demonstrated how social media news feeds can personalize content and even manipulate emotions without the user really being aware of it. Here's an example of what I mean from a TED Talk segment by James Brittle. This is a surprise egg video. Right? It's basically a video of someone opening up loads of chocolate eggs and showing the toys inside to the viewer. That's it. That's all it does for seven long minutes. And I want you to notice two things about this. First of all, this video has 30 million views. Right? 
And the other thing is that it comes from a channel that has 6.3 million subscribers, that has a total of 8 billion views, and it's all just more videos like this. 30 million people watching a guy opening up these eggs. It sounds pretty weird, but if you search for surprise eggs on YouTube, it'll tell you there's 10 million of these videos. And I think that's an undercount, right? I think there's way, way more of these. If you keep searching, they're endless. There's millions and millions of these videos in increasingly baroque combinations of brands and materials, and there's more and more of them being uploaded every single day. Like this, this. Is a strange world, right? But the thing is, it's not adults who are watching these videos. It's kids, small small children. These videos are like crack for little kids. There's something about like the repetition, the constant little dopamine hit of the reveal that completely hooks them in. And little kids watch these videos over and over and over again, and they do it for hours and hours and hours. And if you try and take the screen away from them, they'll scream and scream and scream. And if you don't believe me, and I've already seen people in the audience nodding, if you don't believe me, find someone with small children and ask them, and they'll know about the surprise egg videos, right? So this is this is where we start. It's 2018, and someone or lots of people are using the same mechanism that like Facebook and Instagram are using to get you to keep checking that app, and they're using it on YouTube to hack the brains of very small children in return for advertising revenue. So this is a surprise. Um, and educators need to help students see how seemingly innocuous data, such as social media feeds, search results, YouTube recommendations, can be manipulated by predictive analytics. The users' past online activities create what have been called echo chambers, where users' personal interests, from surprise eggs to political views. Are actually amplified and reverberated in these endless cycles to reinforce rather than actually challenge one's beliefs. So students today need to be taught new literacies of the algorithmic kinds. They need to understand how predictive analytics are used to build rich profiles of users and to target users with content and advertising. These algorithms are actually well-hidden secrets of large technology companies and social media sites. With infinite data input, it's impossible to trace how automated results are actually produced. Here's another little segment from the same speaker. There's, there's easier ways of、um, making ad revenue on on YouTube, right? You can just make stuff up or steal stuff. So if you search for like really popular kids' cartoons like Peppa Pig or Paw Patrol, you'll find that there's millions and millions of these online as well. Of course, most of them aren't posted by the original content creators. They come from loads and loads of different kind of random accounts, and it's impossible to know who's posting them or what their motives might be. Right? And does that sound kind of familiar? Because really, it's exactly the same mechanism that's happening across most of our digital services, where it's impossible to know where this information is coming from. It's basically fake news for kids. Right? And we're training them from birth to click on the very first link that comes along, regardless of what the source is. That doesn't seem like a terribly good idea. Here's another thing. There's, there's... So, in an age of machine learning, literacy needs to include knowledge and tools to actually critique and understand the mechanisms and the consequences of algorithm-driven media, including the decreased privacy associated with their use. So, what will be the new literacies of the future? We can see that trends in literacy practices that have already begun, supported, for example, by the widespread accessibility of mobile phones and the social web, rapid developments now in virtual, augmented, and mixed reality technologies, and we call these extended reality technologies. So, extended reality technologies include all those groups, virtual and augmented. And mixed reality, and this is really critical because these technologies are going to be cutting edge, and they are what's happening in the next ten years. They're going to reach their peak. Now, if you're interested in the ethics of digital spaces, this is an interesting space. What are the ethics of virtual technologies and immersing people in documentaries and stories, and how that will manipulate users when you're actually immersed in the story and you're a character in the story? And how are you positioned? In that story, what are the ethical implications of that? 
Then we've got mixed reality, which also comes with a lot of um, ethical issues associated with the data and how um, data is used. This is an example of mixed reality here. This is the HoloLens 2 headset. So that's what I'm talking about with mixed reality, where I can still see the screen, I can see you, but when I turn it on, I will see holograms and a digital screen that only I can see. So we can look at this little diagram here, which gives us, a, it's called the SAMR model. And we can see that technologies are sometimes just a substitute for a conventional practice. Um, they might be something like, um, you know, you used to carry a dictionary around and now you can carry an app to look up a word. But then we also have things that augment print practices, but with functional improvements. For example, reading ebooks are lightweight, they're more interactive, they're more searchable. You can also share content and they have compact storage. So you might say there are some actual augmented differences. Moving up the model, you have modification. So some technologies that will actually allow for significant change in the way we do things, significant task redesign. Um, and I think of things like painting in 3D immersive virtual reality, it seems really different. And, and you're doing something that is, is not really what we've been doing before because you're in a three-dimensional text, you can create a three-dimensional text and you're immersed in your own text instead of looking at it on a page. And finally, we can look to redefinition. And this is where digital tech allows for the creation of new practices that were previously inconceivable. And this is exciting, but it's also scary in some ways when we think about the ethics of this. For example, my daughter put on the HoloLens 2 headset and with it, she created a digital story involving uh, three-dimensional holograms, characters and settings in biomes and told me a story. Now, I wouldn't have thought that we would be doing that 10 years ago. It's very different, a very different way of telling a story. These categories here in this diagram are not seen as inflexible categories, but are best seen as a continuum. So a range of practices that have greater or lesser resemblances to conventional practices. So in closing, any new vision for literacy practices, whether they're digital or not, needs to be founded on a social justice perspective, a perspective that continues to respect diversity in cultural communities and which works toward a more equitable and a more just society. So thank you. And I've just put there um, the link to um, my website for my current project. If you'd like to know what I'm up to, my um, Twitter, hash, um, Twitter handle and my Facebook. And you've already mentioned um, my books. And on the left, you can see Literacy for Digital Futures. That's just the mock-up of the, of the cover page, which I'm discussing with Routledge at the moment. So you can't buy that. Um, but it's it's coming. So uh, thank you very much and I'll stop sharing my screen.